Those who are able, please remain standing for our gospel lesson. We're reading from Luke chapter 3, verses 15 through 22. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. But Herod, the ruler, who had been rebuked by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the evil things that Herod had done, added to them all by shutting up John in prison. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved, with you I am well pleased. This is the Word of God for us, the people of God. God. Amen. Please be seated. So over the past few uh, weeks, months, I've had a couple of conversations, um, conversations that have stuck with me about baptism. And uh, these were conversations with uh, longtime Methodists, um, committed Christians, who were marveling in the course of our conversation at the power and profound nature of what happens to us in baptism. They, over the course of the conversation, had this kind of astonished revelation about the fact that baptism is one of the most radical and revolutionary things that we do in the church. I've been reflecting on that revelation for the past couple of months because I know it to be true. I know that baptism is one of the most powerful and radical and revolutionary things that we do in the church as Christians. Every time we participate in a baptism, every time a child or an adult comes forward for baptism, it's one of the most powerful and revolutionary and radical things we do in the name of the gospel. I know that to be true, but I've been reflecting on that astonished revelation by these two people because... I realize I don't really know how to relay that truth to other people. At least not in a way that feels compelling. Not in a way that feels at the same level of passion with which I know it to be true. And so I've been reflecting on that and what it means, how I can do it better for the past couple of months. And then today rolls around, and it's baptism of the Lord Sunday. That's our Sunday. That's our celebration for for today. It's a feast in the traditional church year. Baptism of the Lord Sunday, a day we come to celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ was baptized by John in the River Jordan. It's a day when we would normally hear a message based on one of the gospel accounts like the one from Luke that we read. We'd hear all about what it means that Jesus was baptized. But today, I want to talk to you about that passage from Isaiah. Because when I read that passage from Isaiah, the one we read a little earlier, 43, 1 through 7, when I read that a couple of weeks ago as I was trying to get ready and think about what I might preach on, when I saw the words that Isaiah had spoken to the Israelite people, I couldn't help but think, there it is. That's what baptism is. That's what baptism means. That's what we need to hear. That's what we need to know. There it is from Isaiah. So I want to go back, and I want us to talk 
about Isaiah because right from the beginning of this passage in Isaiah, it tells us what the God who created us does for us through baptism. It tells us what the God who created us does for us through baptism. God redeems us. God calls us. And God claims us. God redeems us, God calls us, and God claims us. So what does it mean to be redeemed? What does it mean that we are redeemed? We heard a little bit about it from the kids and from Sarah this morning. But the prophet in this passage says it means that when the waters of life rise, we won't be overtaken. It means that when the fires in our life rage uncontrollably, we won't be consumed. It's a little metaphorical and not really a definition you can use, but I hope the point gets there because it's important what Isaiah doesn't say. We need to notice what he doesn't say because Isaiah doesn't say that the waters won't rise. And Isaiah doesn't say that the fires won't catch. Redemption isn't some magic pill that makes life easy. The redemption we experience in God isn't some formula of the right words that automatically makes all of our worries and troubles and trials go away. Redemption is a lifestyle, a habit, a way of seeing and being in the world that actively seeks God in everything, that actively seeks the way God is making all things new in everything, a way of being that actively looks for the way of Christ, the way of Christ that is different from the ways of the world, the way of Christ that says there is another way beyond the either-or that we believe has to be. Redemption and being redeemed recognizes that God is for us. And if God is for us, who and what can stand against us? God has redeemed us and made us new. God has given us a new way of seeing and being in this world so that we can see God's kingdom emerging around us, so that we can participate in what God has in store for us, so that we can be a part of the redeeming act of God, so that we can help to make all things new, so that we can make choices that honor God so that we can make decisions in this world that look like God's kingdom and not just like the either-or choices that the world presents us with. The both-and kingdom of God. Redemption doesn't mean that it won't be hard. It means we won't be overtaken. And when God is with us in redemption, God isn't just with us in some general way. God doesn't promise to be with us just generally. I'm just with you people. God calls us by name. God calls each and every one of us by name. God says, I know who you are and what I have planned for you. God gives us our identity, and our identity is in God. We are because God is. We find our worth, our nature, our values, our purpose in God and nothing else. God looks at us as he has created us before anything else has happened. Even when we might still be feeling fallen and broken, God looks at us and says, 
I created you good, and I love you. God calls us by name. It says he has a plan and a purpose for each one of us that God is pulling us in. And this part is a little tricky for me because in that passage from Isaiah, Isaiah then says that God gives people for us. That God has sacrificed the people of Egypt and Cush and Seba. That God has sacrificed other peoples and other nations for us, for our life. That makes me a little uncomfortable. It makes me a little uncomfortable to think of these other people perishing for me. But I want to look a little further because having a new and ever renewing identity in Christ is uncomfortable. Whenever God remakes us and makes us new again, it is uncomfortable. When we get a new identity and have to put away the old, whenever we have to see ourselves reflected in God instead of in what the world tells us, that's uncomfortable because it means shedding something that we have held on to for so long, some part of who we are that we just really want to keep. It's uncomfortable. Because it means that all the other identities, all the other nations and peoples and powers of this world, all of our partisan associations, all of our ways of seeing ourselves, all of our purpose given identities, the ways we think that what we do makes us who we are, are sacrificed. To God's identity for us. They fall away in the face of who God says we are. That we are good and worthy and that he loves us and wants us to be with God. It is uncomfortable when all of those other identities, when our nationalism, when our commitment to economic models, when our commitment to the way the world works has to fall away because they try to call us any other name than the name God has given us, it is uncomfortable to have to let that go, to see ourselves only as God sees us, to have the identity that only God wants for us, child of God, disciple, beloved. God calls us by name and God claims us. God claims us as his own, as God's own. No matter where we are, no matter how far we think we've strayed, no matter what we've done, no matter what we're holding on to, no matter what we desire to be that is other than what God would have us to be, God claims us. From the north, the south, the east, and the west, God claims us and invites us home, carries us home, welcomes us home over and over and over again because we are God's. God has claimed us. And no other claim no other claim matters. God does all of this. God does all of this. God does all of 
this by becoming one of us. Being baptized into all the stuff of life, into all the places we can wander, all the identities that claim us, all the struggles and temptations and trials that threaten to overtake us. God does all of this. God submits to being submerged into our humanity, our mortality, our death, so that he can rise to eternal life, conquering death and sin and clearing the way for us to follow. God does all of this through the person and work of Jesus Christ. God does all of this by taking on our humanity, and in that moment when he comes and is baptized by John, that whole narrative is there because Jesus is submitting himself to us, to our depravity, to our brokenness, to our vulnerability, allowing God's self to be submerged into our stuff so that when he rises, we rise with him to new life, to life abundant, to a new way of being and seeing the world. God does all of this because God loves you and me and all the world. The whole of creation, every person, God loves us. And so God does this. And that is what it means for us to experience baptism. That is what we experience every time we baptize a child, every time we baptize an adult. That's why it doesn't matter whether we baptize an adult, as an, I mean a child as an infant or an adult. It doesn't matter because it's not our action. It's God's action. It's not our choice, our will, that brings us to this baptismal font. It is God's. God has chosen already to be for us. And we respond. And we bring a child to be baptized in it as an infant, to say God has done this and God loves you already. God wants you already. God has redeemed you and called you and claimed you already. And we will raise you to respond. And we bring that child to say, you are God's first and ours second. When we come as an adult, we say we are God's first and everyone else's second. That's the radical and revolutionary nature of the gospel because when it comes to our children, they are ours. But releasing them to God, releasing them to God means something different. It means we are responsible for caring for God's good creation. It means we are responsible for raising them to know the grace and the love and the mercy of God, not just of making them successful and happy. God does all of this. Because God loves you and me and all the world. You are redeemed. You are called by name. You are claimed by God. So remember your baptism and be thankful. I'm going to add one. Live like it makes a difference. Remember your baptism and be thankful and live like it makes a difference. Live like you are redeemed. Live like you are called by God. Live your call from God. Live like you are claimed by God, like that identity is the one that matters most, because it is. Live as a child of God. Live as a child of God. Remember your baptism and be thankful. And live like it made a difference.
Would you pray with me? Heavenly Almighty God, we come to you this day acknowledging all you have done for us. All that you do for us on a daily, hourly basis. The ways you hold us up, the ways you give us the strength and the courage, the wisdom to move in this world, to act on your behalf, to be agents of your kingdom. God, we come to you acknowledging the ways that you offer us salvation and redemption through your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to see the ways you are calling us. The ways you are calling us by name into active mission and ministry in this world to be agents of the good news for the least, the last, and the lost. Help us to see the ways you have claimed us. The ways you have given us a new identity, an ever-renewing identity in you that is not bound by the particularities of this world that is not bound by political parties or ideologies or national identities that isn't bound by anything because it is found in you and your love for us. God, help us to see how the ways we live has redeemed is our witness and reflection of who you are and what you are always doing for this world. We ask these things in the name of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, who entered into all the messiness of our life so that we might have life with you. Amen. This morning, our hymn of sending forth is How Firm a Foundation. It's number 529 in your hymnals. Let's stand and sing it together.